Hello all. So today is going to be another day of writing workshop for week six. I'm going to go over the writing a good paper document that I put on the scholar site. Um, rather than just watching me, a useful thing that you could do is go ahead and pull up that document and just sort of follow along. So unfortunately, like I mentioned, I don't have that software anymore, but this will just be more like a standard lecture in which you have the paper that you need in front of you, uh, and then you just listen to me and you can write notes along the paper that you have, either a digital copy up in front of you or print it out and write along. And I encourage you to take notes because some of these things might um, not ring any bells without some examples. Uh, and also some of them, some of the examples I'll provide will be directly germane to your papers hopefully. So it might be helpful fodder to get you thinking. So um, first thing I do here is I'm just going to identify some general practices for success in writing. Um, so one thing that's expected in at least all philosophy papers, and I think this is probably a good practice in general, is that you define all your technical terms. So one way that I've heard uh, a professor put this is that philosophy papers should be maximally self-contained and and what I take that to mean is just that you should know what all of the moving parts refer to within any given paper so it shouldn't really require a whole great deal of background knowledge in order to be able to understand a philosophy paper just some close reading and maybe a couple reads and some hard thinking will be involved but if you give it a solid effort all of the terms that you need to know will be defined, all the relevant background will be covered. Um, and so that's sort of an expectation in these papers too. So not only with technical terms, right, so if you write on um, Hume or something like that, you know, you, you're going to have to define impressions and ideas and so forth. Um, relations of ideas, matters of fact, there's a whole range of them. But uh, more broadly speaking, not just in terms of technical terms, but in general, you should provide the background knowledge that's necessary um, in order for someone to understand what's going on in this paper. So if your mom or a friend or whoever reads your philosophy paper and they give it a reasonable effort, it should be presented in such a way that they could understand it. Um, should be written for general audience and the assumption should be that you don't need to be versed in technical philosophy in order to understand this paper that wouldn't be very useful so just to keep that in mind uh, if, if your friend gives it an honest effort and they just say I have no idea what's going on then you probably need to clarify some of what you're doing a very useful way to clarify is to use signposts and so what I mean by a signpost is simply sort of, as the, as the word might imply, direction as to which way you're headed. Um, so more literally in the context of a paper, you want to say what you've accomplished and what you intend to accomplish at various junctions. So at the end of you know a, a large segment of argument, or at the end of an exposition, or at the end of an introduction, or all these sorts of places, uh, you say, you know, I have just covered the foundations of this debate, and now I will offer my own original position in order to side on behalf of Humean skepticism or whatever, right? Um, but just these sort of signposts that that indicate where the paper is going and where it has been, um, just to make it really clear what you're trying to accomplish just so that there's not any confusion, there's not any sort of inferences that your reader has to make. Um, because, of course, if you kind of leave it open for interpretation, then there's plenty of points at which your reader might drop off or kind of take the wrong reading and be confused as to what you're trying to accomplish. So just make it explicit. And then further point, and this is in some senses redundant, but I guess it's maybe a very general characterization, of all of these other uh, factors that I'm suggesting is that clarity is key. 
So you're going to be dealing with abstract ideas and reasonably complex um, concepts. So throughout this whole process, it's really important to just be thorough and precise. There's no need to use large vocabulary unless it's just the best word for the occasion. Um, you, know, you, you show you're smart by just being able to relay complicated ideas in a clear way, not by adding additional verbiage to the, to the mess of complicated terms that these thinkers are already using. And so clarity will oftentimes be a key differentiator between, say, a B paper and an A paper because, you know, to a certain extent, it doesn't matter how brilliant you are. If nobody knows what you're saying, they'll just kind of assume that you don't know what you're talking about, right? So you have to present it in such a way that it's evident that you know what you're talking about to everyone. So hopefully, hopefully that's clear enough. So now we'll just go through the various parts of a paper and um, yeah, and I'll just provide some additional commentary. I hope to keep these videos relatively short, so I'll keep moving. Um, so for the introduction, there's three key things that I think should be done generally. Uh, first and foremost, well, first anyway, you should motivate and provide an overview. So by um, by motivate, I mean you should try to provide at least some suggestion as to why this is a paper worth writing. Um, so maybe it's not going to be the most groundwork, groundbreaking piece of work that you've ever written or um, in general, right? But at least contextualize the writing such that it makes sense why this would be a reasonable paper to write. You know, so there's this debate about knowledge, for example, and some people claim that knowledge justifies true belief, and other people claim that it's not. So this is an important project insofar as we want to know whether or not we're justified in claiming that we know things. Right? That seems like a reasonable project. And then you're giving some motivation as to why you're writing a paper about Edmund Gettier and about justified true belief. And likewise, um, as part of that, you're providing some sort of overview in terms of what previous people have said, right? So I guess we'll stick with Gettier, right? Gettier maintains this you know, claim. He maintains it for these general reasons. Uh, this is significant for this reason. But I'm going to argue, and then that's the next step, which is the thesis. So first and foremost, a thesis is a statement. And by statement, I mean um, a claim that is either true or false or yes. Uh, so oftentimes people will mask a thesis in, in terms of uh, a rhetorical question or something like that, uh, and that's just not called for. The best way to write a thesis is to just say, this is what I believe, or this is what will be argued. I, I'm really totally a fan of, um, I will argue, blank. There's no problem with first person in philosophy as long as you're still giving good arguments. Um, and as long as not every sentence is beginning with I, right, there are a few times in which it's appropriate to say, I maintain that, or I will argue that, these sorts of things. And that's just a very clear way, sort of a signpost, um, to suggest where you're going to put your thesis. If you say, I will argue, it just lays it out clearly for the reader, for me, to be like, okay, here's the thesis. It's about to come. Um, so, yeah. So it needs to be a statement. And then some other key um, features of a good thesis is that um, it's controversial, right? So by controversial, I just mean it's something that reasonable people could disagree about, right? Um, if your thesis is just that I can't think of any good examples right now of, of, a, of a trivial thesis, but they happen, right? So, so it needs to be on, you know, may, maybe that, um, man, I'm really drawing a blank on that one, but just, just some sort of, um, thesis that not everyone would agree to. I guess this example was written some time ago. Um, I got, I got some papers last time. I was involved teaching this course of just theses that were just like 
Descartes argues for the existence of God, um, and everyone agrees that a anyone that's re read the Meditations is like, yes, clearly he does. So that's not really going to be a sufficient thesis. Um, specific, I know it can sometimes be difficult because these are complex ideas. So, but um, what you want to be doing is getting into a specific debate and addressing one little issue. Sometimes we have the temptation to be providing grand theories because that's more exciting and interesting, uh, stimulating in a certain way to say, you know, oh, everything might be a dream, the matrix is real, uh, but of course, if you're going to do an argument like that, you need a book and not a five-page paper, five to six-page paper. So it needs to be sufficiently specific where you're just kind of addressing one precise issue that you can cover within the time allotted or within the space allotted. Because if you set up your project to be too broad, right, like like proving that we're brains and bats or something like that, it's just not going to be doable. Um, people haven't been able to do that in careers of writing books and countless long articles. And then the final condition that I note here is that it needs to be justifiable. Um, and by justifiable, I mean like on rational grounds, right? So sometimes uh, you might take a thesis like, I, this is a crazy thesis, but if you say something like, I like ice cream, um, there doesn't seem to be any sort of external criteria which you can appeal to, besides the fact that you eat it, um, and that maybe, you know, it puts your brain in certain sorts of states that we associate with pleasure or something like that. But it doesn't seem like something that we can really disagree with. It's just like, yes, yes, you do. Um, so it needs to be, you need to set up your um, thesis in such a way that you can provide an argument to show that it's correct. If you don't do that, um, if you don't set it up in a way that you can provide arguments for it, you're going to have a hard time proving it besides just sort of saying, this is how I feel, and you want to avoid that. And then the last thing that an intro can do, and this has to be very brief, of course, is that it provides a roadmap. And what I mean by roadmap is simply um, the process by which you reach your thesis. So you'll say, I will argue that, you know, justified true belief is insufficient for knowledge along with Gettier for the following reason and provide some sort of, you know, specific distinct position, not just what Getty already said, and then after that you'll say, first I will um, recite the historical debate and consider some examples that Getty uh, uses to justify his claim, then I will provide my own um, thought experiment or counterexample to the claim that justified true belief is knowledge, finally I will provide my original argument for my position. and that last part is the roadmap, right? You're just delineating the series of steps that you're going to take to reach your objective. Just so the reader already kind of knows um, what path you intend to take and how, how you're going to get to your final result. Just one more step in making it a totally transparent paper. So the next big thing, um, and this would be like the body of the paper, is the exposition. So this is kind of the the literature review portion you might call it I could even call it that um, so this this sort of exposition or literature review is where um, you are going to just recite recite the historical debate and set up the problem so that you can later address it so the first thing that you would do is giant truck driving by you, um, so first say, you know, Hume's problem of induction has been historically characterized as a dilemma, and then you'll explain the various parts and why the problem arises. So this is the part in which you would define impressions, define ideas, define relations of ideas, matters of fact, and go through and reconstruct the argument and how it leads to, ultimately, um, no good answer, no, a skeptical 
uh, doubt about the possibility of justifying matters of fact. Um, and so one of the reasons why it's useful to reconstruct arguments is because you can do it in a more efficient and clearer fashion, right? So, so on first read, Hume's argument might not be the, as obvious as it could be. You can make it more obvious because you have secondary sources, you've had lectures on it, it's been well discussed, and you can reread it. Um, it's always sort of harder to do these things perfectly the first time anyone discovers it, and we have the benefit of sort of hindsight. So you can clearly lay it out and just say it's a dilemma, you know, matters of fact can't be justified by relations of ideas or by causal inferences. So there's no good way, right? You're going to have to explain all the, the steps in between, but you can have that broad overview that makes much more sense of how the argument is supposed to run. Um, and then another thing that people often do, philosophers often do, is that they just sort of um, skip steps, right? So you, you'll take this case. So it'll go something like this. Someone will say just P, therefore Q, right? And take take it as obvious enough right if there's um, if there's fire or so say P is there is fire and then Q therefore there is smoke right um, and it seems like sure that's obvious enough that that seems to roughly follow but of course the implicit premise here is that if there is fire then there is smoke um, and that's something that you can identify that the original author failed to identify. So a lot of times they're making assumptions, like Hume, for example, seems to think that there's only um, two ways to justify matters of fact, right? It can only, all knowledge is either relations of ideas or um, matters of fact, and there's no other alternatives. I'm not sure that he ever states that. Maybe he briefly does. Uh, but sort of identifying these kinds of background assumptions is a really useful thing to do. And that's a little bit of original philosophy. If you can do that, you're already um, kind of providing an original contribution, and that will help you out considerably. So once you've done this um, sort of exposition, background work, you'll need to provide your original argument. And so this, I can't stress enough, is essential, right? So you can have a perfect paper up till this point, and if you don't do this point, it's just, it's just, I mean, philosophy papers, you can't get an A unless you're doing original work. Um, so your exposition could be flawless, but if you don't really add anything novel, um, then it's not going to work. So. By original argument, I really want to emphasize, and this is something I've been trying to um, get us to do on a weekly basis, is to provide arguments and not just sort of general uh, feelings or thoughts or reflections, right? Because it's easy enough to say, oh, this really stimulated my thoughts, and I can relate this to, um, you know, a case where my neighbor thought he saw his cat in the backyard, but it was really just a brown bag, so Gettier seems to be right. Um, that is interesting, and I'm glad you're applying it to everyday life, but that's not an original argument, right? That's kind of uh, just one more example of some work that's already been done. Um, so you need to do some more original work than that. Some examples that I provide include show, showing why a premise is false, undermotivated, or improbable. So sometimes, first, of course, you'll have to have reconstructed the argument clearly enough to where you can identify individual premises. Um, if you want, this is non-mandatory, but you can s totally reconstruct arguments in just syllogistic form, right? Just like if P then Q and just totally lay it out line by line and show how each step is supposed to follow. And then you have a really easy job of um, later on critiquing the various premises because all you have to say is premise one as we recall, holds that, and it's already written out explicitly. Um, so you'll show why 
for example, a premise is false or under-motivated, right? So a lot of times these premises aren't clearly um, empirically verifiable. They'll just be sort of plausible or implausible, and you might draw out some implications and say why um, some premise seems really implausible for whatever reason, um, and that sort of thing. Or, of course, if it's not a deductive form of argument, you might want to show why it's uh, inductively weak, right? Why these sorts of considerations don't strongly support, you know, so, so take the case of all ideas come from impressions. One of the arguments is that um, think of any given idea and it should be traceable back to some impression. So you might think there's a sample size issue in which, you know, even if I do this process of thinking of various ideas and trying to trace them back to the impression, I can only do that for so long and I'm constantly having ideas. Um, so we're only getting a very minute total portion of uh, possible cases, right? So it's not a very strong piece of evidence to, to this argument is inductively weak. So there's a good idea. Um, and then the other thing you can do, so these, these two that I've already noted, the first two things that you can do are um, sort of negative work in, in that they're detracting from another position. And another alternative is that you do some positive original work. So maybe take the Gettier, or go back to the Gettier case, and um, think, you know, so the conclusion is something roughly like justified true belief is not sufficient for knowledge, right? That's, that's a general claim. You might find another way to prove that same sort of conclusion. Um, so you might identify maybe a different case in which Maybe someone has knowledge and they don't have a belief or something like that. Some other way of showing how the um, those three conditions aren't necessary. Um, and then a final note is that just avoid the shotgun method. So the shotgun method is um, trying to provide a whole large series of arguments very briefly to sort of overwhelm the opposition. Um, there's another term for this too. Somebody gallop. It's like a, but anyway, um, the shotgun method in, in my terms is just, so maybe you're familiar, some of you have done deba debate, or you're at least roughly familiar with debate, right? You say, I have five or six points, and these are all my points that support this conclusion. Um, in philosophy, it's much preferable especially considering your space constraints, that you do one, maybe two um, thoughts thoroughly, as opposed to doing five or six in a couple sentences each. Because in most cases, you're not going to be doing a good enough job of really clearly laying out your original ideas um, so that other people know what you're talking about or so that you've addressed the possible concerns. And then... Uh, a very last thing that you can do as part of your original work is consider possible objections. Um, and so somebody might, you know, you might say, oh, there's a, you know, Hume has a false dilemma. There's, there's other alternatives in terms of how we could possibly justify um, matters of fact. That might be like your original thought and you've done some work to motivate that and justify that claim. And then you might consider, well, somebody will say, oh, that's not really a new form. That's really just a matter of fact. Um, but then you could object and say, no, that's not actually just a matter of fact for these other reasons. So consider possible objections, right? You can, you can always imagine somebody else, some opposition, arguing against you and kind of predict those counter-arguments and rebut them before they occur, just to kind of buttress your account. Um, okay, so that leads us just to the conclusion. Um, honestly, conclusions are my top priority. I made these papers relatively short, so if you don't have space for a conclusion, that's understandable. It's more important that you do 
a thorough and excellent job of the exposition and of course your original argument than it is to just tack on a conclusion. Um, but conclusions aren't a bad thing, so if you do have this space, I de definitely recommend that you just briefly uh, review what you've accomplished, right? So maybe even, you know, in brief, do the same thing that you did in the intro, but uh, please don't just copy and paste the intro. I see that sometimes, and that's not a good thing. Present it in novel terms, but cover the same basic ideas, um, and show, you know, discuss what you've shown. You've proved something new, hopefully and uh, just remind the reader of what you've accomplished. And then you might, as a final note, say why this matters. Um, and this is kind of analogous to the motivation thing. You just um, give some sense of, look, now that, you know, now that I've shown that there's a solution to the problem of induction or that the problem of induction um, doesn't stand, scientists can more justifiably claim to know things about the future or to make causal inferences or to say that there are laws of nature or something like that, you know, give some sense of why this matters because, of course, most of the problems that I'm having you cover are significant problems in, in our accounts of knowledge or understanding of the world. So I hope that was helpful. Um, please, of course, ask any questions if you have any. And I look forward to reading your papers. Okay, bye.